Matthias thinks, looking over the three activator tiles aside the door. Slowly but surely, the answer becomes clear to him. He presses one of the activators, turning it on. After waiting a minute or so, he presses it again to turn it off. Then he presses the third activator and opens the door. Inside is a small chamber some 25 feet in width. A stone pillar rises up in the center of the room, with three flame sconces spaced out evenly around its circumference. One of the sconces is currently lit. The lit flame's the activator on the right. He goes up to the pillar and touches the other two unlit sconces. One of them is hot to the touch. And this one connects to the activator on the left, and this cold one is for the middle activator. Epsilon Nykta, the 241st, gives a slight nod. You have answered correctly. As I stated, you will be rewarded. The Diorthocans approaches the far wall in the chamber, makes a pattern of taps with its multiple legs, and a large compartment opens up. Choose two of the following. There is a suit of silken armor, a suit of scale armor, a shield, a glaive, a longsword, a longbow with a quiver of arrows, and a pack with a wardstone, a flask of alchemist's fire, and 50 feet of rope. He considers the options, each one valuable and beneficial in its own way. Though some armor would be quite a boon of protection, he cannot pass up the glaive. It is a sturdy polearm with a sharp blade on top, much like the ones he saw the serpent guards wielding back at the Fane. For the second selection, he chooses the pack with the ward stone, alchemist fire, and rope, given how much utility the option offers. You have made your selections. May these items serve you well in the trials. He reseals the wall compartment. You are also free to use this chamber as a sanctuary for one day. The Diorthocans leads the neophyte out of the chamber, shuts the door, and positions himself beside it. What lies that way? Matthias points towards the end of the Great Corridor, which opens up into a massive area of the maze. That way leads to the Greater Labyrinth. I suggest you avoid it, for the dangers there are even greater. You may come across other paths in the trials that lead to such expanses. My warning remains the same for them all. Is there anything out there besides roving beasts and deadly obstacles? For certain. Can you tell me more? What's beyond the trials? Perhaps some other time. Do you always stay by this door? It is rare that I go too far away from it. This is my station. And are there more of your kind in the trials? For certain. The sun is reaching its zenith overhead. Matthias eats a hunk of dense loaf, dried meat and roasted nuts, and takes a gulp from his water skin. He has already collected a number of items from his short time in the trials. He is a strong young man, so he is not encumbered, but he is definitely starting to notice the weight. Many thanks, Epsilon. I just might be back to use the sanctuaries you offered. I shall be here. Matthias heads back to the crumbling basin area, then steps through the door he had opened southward. He traverses this stretch of corridor for a time, always keeping a wary lookout for dangers. Overhead flies a sentinel drake, passing by. It is a winged construct from the prior era that would watch out for those who went above the labyrinth walls. Flight, in particular, was tightly restricted by the ascendancy, as they regulated the use of all flying machines. Matthias tightens up at the sight of the powerful creature. He grasps the glaive and prepares to dart for cover behind a pointed boulder. The metallic drake glances at him only briefly, then continues its flight. The young warrior sighs in relief, glad that the thing paid him no mind. He soon comes to a section where there are two massive sets of doorways, both of which are open, one leads to the east, and the other is straight ahead, farther down the corridor. He looks about and listens too. He finds nothing that is hidden, though he notes that some of the smaller rocks could be used as sling ammunition if he ever runs low. As he is looking around, he notices something even more interesting. On one of the wall columns, there is an etching that displays certain patterns and symbols. 
At the top of the etching is a stylized icon of the huge organ instrument he had come across just a bit ago. He studies this plate in the wall column, trying to make sense of it. While the symbols at first confound him, the more time he spends looking over it, the more it starts to make sense to him. After a while, he has figured out the logic to the patterns. It appears that the organ chamber requires a sequence of three two-note combinations, 1-4, 2-5, and 3-5. Though Matthias is curious about what lies beyond these two new doors, he is more curious still to play the grand ascendancy instrument. He returns to the organ chamber. The neophyte approaches the touch pads and sets his hands upon them. He plays the sequence of note combinations, starting with the first and fourth notes, then the second and fifth, and finally the third and fifth. Each time, the notes harmonize with the low drone. After playing the set of three, the heavy slab on the eastern wall slides to the side, opening the way. Matthias steps into this new sector of chambers and maze-like passages. It is an interior area with ceilings 20 to 30 feet above. He hears the sound of movement nearby. His grip on the glaive tightens, and his sling hangs at the ready from his leather belt. With quiet and careful steps, he begins up a set of stairs. Immediately he spots a Kexia maggot slugging along a section of the wall. The worm is scrounging about with its mandibles and has not yet noticed the young man. He quietly sets down his glaive loads a sling bullet, and attacks. The bullet strikes the creature. It flinches back and writhes in shock from the sudden wound. It is badly injured. Coming down the stairs of the adjoining chamber is a statue-like figure. She is an Ikoriite of some kind, though quite different from the Serpent Guards. Her plating is ceramic and in bad condition. In fact, her whole appearance is decrepit. She has a crystal embedded just above her eyes. It crackles with energy, then releases a pulse of lightning. The small blast strikes Matthias. Pain ripples through him. He grits his teeth and returns the attack with a sling bullet. The leaden bullet hits the Ikoriite, making a sizable crack in her torso. The wound triggers an ethereal command. Drop your weapons! The compulsion grapples Matthias' mind. He is in a losing struggle against it. Before it overcomes him, he picks up his glaive and darts down the stairs for cover. The leaping maggot, badly hurt, wriggles into the corner. The decrepit statue woman plods ahead with a limping gait. The supernatural command finally overtakes Matthias. He casts his glaive and sling to the floor and stares at the Ikoriite. She looms at the top of the stairs. Her crystal scintillates again and releases a small, crackling bolt. The zap is quite minor, but it still hurts. The ceramic lady comes closer and grabs the glaive from the floor. This does not belong to you, thief. Matthias fights through the compulsion and regains control of himself. It is a moment of panic, and by instinct he takes his father's club in hand. He swings it wildly. The attack smacks against the woman's plating ineffectively. He grits his teeth, determined to prevail. The Ikoriite raises up the polearm. Though she does not appear to be trained in the use of such weapons, she strikes at the neophyte.
the glaive descends, but luckily Matthias evades the blow. In the blink of an eye, he makes a riposte with the Ashwood Club. The sturdy club smashes the Ikoriite's head. Fragments of ceramic burst forth from the lethal wound, and crimson fluid follows. She crashes to the floor, defeated. Matthias' heart is beating a savage rhythm. He kisses his father's club. You taught me well, father. You and the others. He stows the club, then the sling, and pries the glaive out of the lifeless hands of the statue woman. Where is that leaping worm? Cautiously, he moves up the steps. He looks about and listens. Uncertain where the creature is, he moves forward on quiet steps. He looks around the protruding wall, and there it is. The wounded worm had lay in waiting. It releases its toxic spray. It spatters against the wall near Matthias's head. He instantly leaps forward with a glaive strike. The curved blade nearly chops the maggot in two. Again, the neophyte has found victory in battle. It was hard won, but a victory nonetheless. Matthias heads up one of the next sets of stairs, again moving quietly and carefully as he goes. It leads to a set of two long dead-end passages on his left, and a larger chamber a ways ahead. He steps into the first left-hand passage. At the end is a complex series of symbols and ascendancy runes. Matthias believes it to be some manner of activator, and he looks it over, trying to make sense of it. By pressing a sequence of symbols, he activates the wall panel. Visual information appears before him, projected through illusory images and words. It provides an overview of several types of ascendancy creations, all wonders of engineering combined with wizardry. He sorts through all manner of lore regarding the various works of artifice. Each sky tower was built with two main types of weaponry. Cannons fashioned in the likenesses of dragon heads, which fired high-speed projectiles shaped like rounded diamonds. And a Magnus Oculus, a huge port on the bottom of a tower that was capable of delivering devastating blasts of energy, like colossal bolts of lightning that would streak downward, obliterating everything and everyone under the tower. Matthias finds there is access to an archive of sky towers in the region. He reads that they were all destroyed in the war. One of them seems to have fallen just some miles away from the garden where he lives. There were other kinds of ascendancy weapons, including personal arms fashioned from alloys of rare and alchemically processed metals. These included hand cannons that fired a smaller variety of the diamond-shaped projectiles, as well as the fabled Sunder Lances, elite pole arms that could be extended and retracted by the wielder. The most powerful of the Sunder Lances were imbued with magical properties that made them incredibly effective in personal combat. He also learns that the Diorthacances were created over many decades in a series of generations. Each generation had a number of production cycles within it, and each cycle bringing about a vast number of plasmas, the individual Diorthacances. They were made to serve various functions. They attended to the repair and maintenance of the labyrinth, and were supplied and managed by numerous kinds of overseers and taskmasters. Many generations and cycles of Diorthacances were also made as water bearers. They can hold water in an internal tank and can release the water through a spout. Such a Diorthacance can fill its tank with liquid at the same rate a person can drink. After one hour, liquids inside the Diorthacance are separated into pure water, which it retains, and other substances, which it exudes. Matthias marvels over the amount of information and diagrams contained in this panel. It's incredible. Things I've wondered and dreamt about my whole life. There's far too much for me to stay reading here all day. I might have to return here later. He then backs out and goes into the second of the twin passages. At its end is a different wall panel. It has two built-in sand glasses that can be rotated. One is marked as a timer for five minutes, 
and the other for nine minutes. The top center of the panel has a rune along with the instruction, press with hand, hold, and remove at exactly 13 minutes.